Good evening. Welcome to Conversations at Art Basel, Miami Beach. I'm Ed Winkleman, and our panel today is what do young collectors expect from the art market? Uh, we have assembled a range of opinions on that topic, and our conversation will be guided by our moderator, Alexander Forbes, who's the market strategist at Artsy. And I will just ask if you will join me in giving them all a very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Ed, and uh, thank you all for joining us and also on the live stream. I'm really excited about today's panel and the topic, which is super important for the industry right now as we think about how to bring in new collectors, cater to young collectors' needs, understand how we can serve them better. Um, with me today is Joanna Bellarado Samuels, who's the founder of We Buy Gold, a roving gallery presenting exhibitions, commission projects, and public events, and director at the Jack Shaman Gallery in New York. Uh, she's on the curatorial team of the Racial Imaginary Institute, which seeks to change the way that we imagine race in the United States and internationally by featuring works of artists, writers, knowledge producers, and activists. Joanna is also the founding director of Four Freedoms, the first artist-run super PAC, uh, which uses art to inspire deeper political engagement for citizens who want to have a greater impact on the American political landscape. Next to Joanna is Paul Leong, who's an avid collector of works by contemporary and emerging artists. His collection includes works uh, by artists working across many different mediums, such as Lawrence Abu Hamdan, Ian Chang, Heji Shin, Claire Leden, Wolfgang Tillmans, Lutz Bacher, and many others. Paul is an officer of MoMA's Contemporary Arts Council and a co-chair of the FCA Friends at the Contemporary, or at the Foundation, sorry, for Contemporary Arts. Last but not least, Elena Sobeleva is the director of online sales at David Zorner, uh, which is a newly created position about a year ago as part of an increased focus on digital initiatives at the gallery. Elena leads the programming, curation, and strategy for the gallery's digital channels, uh, which include over 20 online exhibitions, 25 art previews annually, as well as the gallery's online viewing rooms. Prior to joining David Zorner, Elena was an early employee and lead curator at Artsy, where we had the privilege of working together for a number of years. Uh, and where she oversaw collector initiatives and programming both online and offline. Uh, Elena's also written about the art market and previously worked at the Jack Shaman Gallery with Joanna <laughs> and at Christie's. So there's a lot of CV overlap on the panel today. Um, I'm Alexander Forbes. I work in corporate development and market strategy at Artsy. Uh, where we partner with over 4,000 galleries, art fairs, auction houses, and institutions to provide the uh, most comprehensive platform to discover and collect art online. And I think. We'll jump into what collectors expect from the art market uh, in a moment, but I think just to ground us in a discussion a little bit, I uh, wanted to start off by just understanding a little bit more about who these young collectors are and if there are differences even in the makeup of, uh, of, of younger people buying today. And Paul, I guess, is our token uh, young collector on the panel. I wondered if you'd start us off by just kind of giving a little bit of history about how you began collecting, um, what drove you into the market, and and also maybe if you have many other friends that collect and, and what that looks like. Yeah, um, I guess I was always sort of generally interested in art, but didn't come from a family that collected or anything. So, you know, started with things that, you know, probably I knew that were more common, like pop and photography, um, but then had some friends that lived in the same building that started to get more into contemporary. And it was actually at a Art Basel Miami, like, I guess eight years ago now, that they were walking around with an advisor. And once someone was able to explain all the meaning behind the works, I just thought it was fascinating how much more was kind of beyond uh, what you saw visually. And it just became kind of an addiction from there. And Joanna, I, I think one thing that struck me in, in kind of our conversations in the lead up to this is kind of a question of uh, to what extent young collectors are coming from any different backgrounds than we've seen before. Um, you know, we've seen a, a rise in particular in the last couple of years in uh, the markets for women artists and artists of color. Uh, is that being driven by or driving in uh, groups that haven't previously been so prominent on the collecting stage? I think it's both. I mean, I, I do think that, I mean, I'm also coming from a roster of artists that is very global, very diverse, so that's the kind of positioning that I come from already. Um, so I do think that our collector base has always kind of been that, perhaps more than some other spaces. Um, but I do think that the more 
work that's shown that is by a more diverse group of artists, naturally collectors will see themselves in the work more um, than previously and, and feel as though there's an, an entry point that I think that has always been kind of problematic in the art world for people of color, for women. Um, so I definitely think that that is, that is driving. I mean, for me, it's also deeply important to kind of foster those other communities um, for the longevity of the artist, for the, for the work, for the market. Um, for the health of the market, for the health of, you know, avoiding trends, per se, or moments, and sustainability for those artists. So I think it's really important to, um, to be committed to, to growing those groups. But I definitely think that uh, it has a lot to do with kind of diversity of artists being shown. That totally resonates. And I think, as you said, we need to continue to bring in new groups to the market to, to allow it to expand, to support more artists out there. Elena, you know, I think, Many in the art industry have been waiting for the entry of the, the tech billionaires. Um, and uh, I wonder if, if you've seen that at all in your new role, particularly in online sales, or um, any other industries of, of people that are coming into the market today? Thanks, Alex. Um, I think that really um, online inherently makes um, work more accessible and really opens up geographic boundaries. And that is clearly something that we've found. And um, I think one thing I've stated in the past is that our top uh, works um, have really, you know, by value sold to collectors where we don't have a gallery. So in cities um, such as Tokyo, Moscow, San Francisco, um, Houston, uh, Dallas, for sure. And so in a way of working online and putting works into um, that contact opens up to a new audience, to an audience of industries beyond just New York. And do those individuals, you know, if, if, and I guess that goes across the board, but do those individuals have different tendencies or expectations from what you've seen, or is it an experience level that... I think to go back to your original definition of what is a, a young collector, it's um, for, you know, for us, we look at someone who is beginning um, at the beginning stages of their collecting career. And so age there is not actually the main factor. It's really someone who is getting to know what is the art market, um, learning about those artists, um, learning and you know, really trying to educate themselves in uh, their entire practice, in their price points, um, in really learning about the medium that they work with. And so I think that online is very well suited to that, but that's really just uh, the first stage of a collector life cycle in some ways as well. That, that resonates with some research that we did earlier this year at Artsy where we um, surveyed around 4,000 art collectors uh, and, and found that you know, one of the most important determining factors in their tendencies was how long they'd been collecting and less so than age. Um, one of the other things I thought was really interesting in that research was that a lot of the main drivers of collecting today are um, quite similar to what they've been in the past. You know, people are collecting for the passion. They want to live with works. Um, and Paul, that kind of brought me to, you know, you are known as someone who collects maybe non-traditional works of art, but you uh, have collected in a fairly traditional way. And I'm, you know, I'm curious to what extent you think that that is the norm across other collectors of our generation, or, uh, and, and kind of what ch made you choose to go down that path? Um, hard to say what, you know, other people in my peer set are doing, though I do think there's, you know, a, a logic to, you know, buying things that you can fit in your house and live with. Um, I think I've always sort of been inspired when I see um, collections that are, you know, you know, if you go to the Rubel Museum or, you know, SF MoMA and you see the Fishers and you see these bigger monumental installations and that really capture, you know, what, you know, some of the artist's best work might be. And so in collecting younger and emerging artists, I've always thought, okay, well, in these moments, um, maybe it's great to take a chance or go deeper with an artist and acquire some of those larger works, even if it's maybe something I can't live with immediately or have to rearrange my furniture so it fits. Um, that's been, you know, part of what's kind of you know, driven me as a collector to really get in deep with an artist and, you know, acquire the best works that I have the opportunity to. So um, that's just been part of my um, collecting logic, I guess, as it were. So I've been willing to make, you know, 
spatial sacrifices for it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say uh, those other friends that you were living with early on that kind of got you into the practice, are they, are they collecting similarly or do they kind of take a different path? I think sometimes, I think they can be interested in the same things. I do think there's, you know, you know, over the last, you know, couple of years, I, I do think that, you know, with more data, with people following auctions more, I do think there is a t more tendency for people to care about, you know, what the intrinsic or inherent value of some of these works are. And so when they think that things that don't fit on walls or don't fit in houses as easily are sometimes less, um, you know, resaleable or that they'll be stuck holding it for the long term, I think it sometimes is a preventative for them to go take the risk on some of those. Um, but I do think they still find them interesting. But I think there's a difference between people appreciating a large work in a museum or meridians or wherever and actually deciding to acquire it. We found a similar thing when we, in our, in our survey, um, younger collectors I think were much more likely than older collectors to look with a lens to perhaps not investment in terms of you know, what's my rate of return going to be on this artwork, um, but a bit more of if it will hold its value um, and is there a potential for resale down the line. I think, you know, there's been plenty of ink spilled over the kind of financial realities of millennials and maybe there's something there as well. And I also wonder, you know, to the extent that these are people who may be uh, reselling clothing on the real real or, uh, you know, using something like Rent the Runway, uh, if that also changes behaviors and how they might act in the art world. But I guess, you know, when you think, Joanna, about traditional collectors, what's been considered to make a good collector, certainly resale hasn't been part of that. So as a gallerist, how do you adapt to that desire, if at all? Or are there, I guess, other platforms that are better served to, to cater to that need? The need to like resell. Or the, the desire to resell. <clears throat> sure. um, I think what... For me, with younger collectors and, and individuals who are trying to learn on how to, how to participate, how to get access, there's a lot of education around what that means and the kind of safety of the work. Um, I think that, for me, transparency is really important with those kind of conversations. I don't necessarily shy away from having a conversation about what the market is and what that means, just because I think that, you know, that opacity kind of is a trigger for a lot of people, um, as are wait lists, you know, or, like, confirm their deepest suspicions about what the art world is. Um, so I, I think it's just good to be honest about those conversations. I think that it's good to just help educate on, on what a good collector is and why that's important and to like to really lean in and not be afraid to have those conversations, you know, and to really explain. I think that everything that we do, I, I believe in the reasons why we do it. And I find that a lot of collectors are just not having those conversations with gallerists. Yeah. Kind of not learning how, they're why. Not, why. They're not learning the why. They're learning the you do this or you don't do this, but they're not really deeply understanding why that's the most important thing for the artist. And, and I think it's really important also for me to get to know collectors similarly to the way I get to know artists. You know? And I think that those relationships provide a, you know, a barrier and some safety in terms of placing work with individuals. Is there a way you can kind of start to develop that relationship even if you might not be able to place a work with them early on? Yeah, definitely. I think that's super important, um, especially if they are interested in artists that it's just not going to happen for a while. Um, I would definitely, I mean, the obvious, I would like to introduce them to other work, obviously. Um, but I just think it's important to engage and to let them know that we're still here and we can continue to have conversations in different directions and to encourage them to show up too. I think that a lot of collectors need to kind of learn that, that you know, to show up and come and see shows and, um, you know, coming after two or three artists, you know, fiercely is not necessarily going to um, help grow your collection and help the relationship that we have. It's interesting. I do wonder to what extent, you know, there has been such a shift from you know, a collector who might have a relationship with a couple galleries really collect across the platform to maybe individuals who are going after a few select artists with a lot of demand. Um, Elena, do you think that the, the internet has been a driver of that tendency among younger collectors? Or, or, and how do you kind of adapt to that in your program? To step back, 
um, overall, I feel obviously that um, internet and the sort of age of much more connected digital culture and instant image sharing has created um, more unified sort of voice and everyone is sort of looking at the same thing at the same time. We are, are sort of much more living in this global image economy constantly. Um, and, and so that has accelerated um, a lot of things um, and a lot of demand. However, I really um, agree to Joanna's point of I think building the relationship and one of the things that uh, was foundational in how we started is um, in online sales you inquire and it's not a click to buy, it's click to start a relationship with one of our directors. And so when someone you know goes online and um, does inquire, they actually get put through to someone who's a director or even partner of the gallery. And I think that's a really unique opportunity to start a relationship and to learn. Um, and so I think that's really key in all of this um, is despite all the noise that really start to form those sort of deeper bonds. And that allows you to, to push them further into the program or I guess what, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think the collectors have, um, a lot of um, you know even accessibility to a program like ours, but um, again you know they have an opportunity to collect from galleries and that are younger in the Lower East Side that are the same age as you know they are, um, or they have an opportunity to also come and collect artists from our program who are still within their you know budget. And online, of course, is an incredible tool because it has price transparency. And it also um, allows for us to work with some of our artists and put together um, editions and multiples. And one example of this was something we did with Josh Smith, who is a very desirable artist and obviously had an incredible show and worked with us to put together an online viewing room of monotypes that were in the price range of you know 2,000 to 15,000. So really accessible. Um, got a lot of collectors excited, um, and um, for some people, it was the first purchase that they ever made, which was really neat. And they're part of the, you know, David Zwerner collector family now, and they have someone they can call and learn from, and again, be part of our sort of, um, you know, kind of big broader group that can follow along some of these artists. And this is their first sort of step in that direction. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting way of giving young collectors a way to get something on the wall. Um, from an artist that they really uh, aspire to, to own an original from someday. Um, what, what have the artist's reaction been to that? Because I think some, sometimes... Uh, I think artists are really excited about people who are buying their work for the first time. I'll say that one of our artists, Neo Rausch, um, you know, he, his prints are still super accessibly priced, uh, while his paintings obviously have a much higher value. Um, because he really wants people to be able to collect them. He wants everyone to be able to collect them. And when he, you know, such an established painter who I admire so much sees the online viewing room and gets excited about that and wants to launch a specific print just for sort of online, that is something that is sort of an accomplished goal. And then art other artists in the program look to that um, and they see, um, they see that and they sort of, sort of themselves start to think about what they want to do with the space. Paul, I guess, you know, kind of come back a little bit though. Um, I know in our, in our kind of conversation leading up to the panel, uh, you mentioned that it's, it seems harder to be a quote unquote good collector today as a young collector than it might have been. And I wonder if you could dig into that a little bit for us here and kind of the, the challenges to collecting in depth that may be different uh, that a young collector is facing today than in the past. Um, I think, you know, one thing that's different about, you know, maybe now versus 10, 20 years ago is you know, online and the speed at which information is dis disseminated around the world, like, you know, you do have much more attention to things and, you know, the market in good or bad, I think, you know, speeds a lot of things up. So, you know, I've found it personally difficult to, you know, I might find a young artist, start buying some work and in, you know, maybe two years, I might find myself priced out of that artist, whereas maybe before it would take five years or seven years. So it's a little harder to um, collect in depth in the same way that I think people were into the past. And I think when we go through various bubbles or something becomes really popular or really hot, then, you know, I think even for people that have, you know, great relationships with galleries and know the artists, it can still become, you know, um, 
difficult sometimes to access the work just because the demand is so much higher and there are a lot of more people just in the market. Um, and I think the reality of you know younger galleries, mid-tier galleries having to contend with you know higher rents, cost. You know I think there is a financial reality where if they are able to price you know a younger artist um, maybe a little bit higher than and it still sells. Um, part of the economic reality means that they might have to do that, um, even at the expense of either younger collectors or, you know, sometimes the artist, if they're unable to sustain that price point. And I think you've seen, you know, over the last five years, a lot of times where someone's prices have gone up too quickly and it wasn't sustainable and it was bad for the artist and the gallery um, and probably collectors. So it's a tough situation, I think, with a lot of different variables, but um, certainly just the pace at which the market moves and how many more people are in there, I think it's a very different collecting landscape than it was, you know, in the past. It's really interesting what you mentioned around kind of particularly on the small and mid-sized gallery range that they have a, a very hard time investing in that kind of lifetime value of the collector. Um, Joanna, you mentioned kind of early in the conversation weightless and how you can... Um, you know, work with a with a, a young person that comes in and wants the uh, very in demand artist, while also having that artist's kind of best interest, career development in mind. I wonder if you could kind of walk us through how you make those trade offs when thinking about uh, developing a younger collector over time, and and what's going to to drive them. I mean, I wish that I had a better answer. That I'd really think that we lose a lot of collectors that way. You know, I definitely think that there's a whole team of people who um, I haven't been able to and we haven't been able to to nurture and carry along because they came in looking for one, two, or three specific artists and it was it's just frankly impossible. Um, I, you try to manage, I try to manage expectations, be encouraging, um, be kind with it, but it, I think that that's, it's a sad reality that I think we lose a lot of people. Um, I think those that stand out are the ones that decide that they're going to become really engaged with the gallery, explore the rest of the roster, you know, continue to be in touch, show up, as I was mentioning, and then we start to build a relationship. And, and I do think that we, we do try to um, really encourage the younger collectors, and we do think about them when we're thinking about where this work is going to go. Um, I, just to make sure that collectors continue to build their collections, that artists are a part of that. Um, so we do prioritize younger collectors. If, they're, if we feel like they're really strong homes where this work can go, um, it's not necessarily gonna be the same kind of a weight because we do think it's important for our artists to have wider and wider collector bases. So it's just that kind of balance and negotiation and a lot of discussions and um, you know, internally, but also just trying to hold on to those collectors who <laughs> just want to run. Yeah. That makes sense. One of the things that you hear about the most, I guess, looking at um, kind of the wider economic landscape and how things are shifting are, is the move towards experiences among millennials and Gen Z. Um, and we're seeing that more and more in the art world as well. Uh, I know, Elena, you guys have a rather popular show up at the moment <laughs> with Indeed. Kusama. Uh, lines, three, three hour lines? Um, that's that's what I hear for Saturdays. So, I guess how, how do you think about engaging people in that more experiential way? Is that is that something that you see more among the kind of enthusiasts, or are those are there collectors who are really coming after you for uh, something that they could uh, live with in a more experiential way too? I, I think the experiential shift is um, an amazing opportunity for um, you know first of all just getting more people to see art. And secondly, for then um, possibly um, educating some of those enthusiasts to potentially then support um, and become collectors. And um, for Kusama, this is such a great example because right now, obviously, I am everyone's best friend in Chelsea right now because the lines are so long, and um, you know it's, it's been great to see 
the city sort of really come out and show up for the show. But what's really impressive is then um, how um, institutions, for example, can acquire her work. And one great example is that the Art Gallery of Ontario, for example, to buy the Kusama piece, um, half of the funds came from crowdfunding. And that was something quite novel. And I've gotten to know personally some collectors who actually just support institutions, um, really are on museum boards, but they themselves don't feel feel the need to have that level of ownership and actually attachment to the object hanging in their home, but they are happy with sort of the benefit of being part of this community, part of this sort of circle of people who are supporting and creating um, cultural moments. And I think that's very, very interesting and certainly in line with a lot of the other shifts what we've seen um, towards sort of more um, experience over <coughs> object. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm eagerly waiting to see what happens with Pace's PaceX initiative and kind of how they monetize these artworks in a new uh, way. I think it's really exciting to see how that will bring in new audiences to art and also um, allow artists to, to make money off of their work that maybe has been a lot harder in the past. That's something that, that you've kind of focused on, Paul, I know in your, in your collecting, but I'm curi curious to do you engage with performance and experiential art as well or um, more still object-based things? Um, I've definitely acquired, you know, several video type artworks, um, other pieces involving probably sound that do have experiential components. Um, I was considering one, um, a piece by the artist that, uh, Tino Chagall, which is, you know, consists all of performances sometimes performed by the collector and sometimes, you know, you have to hire a whole acting crew to put it on. Um, so, you know, I'd say I'm pretty open to some of those, and sometimes I see, you know, a video or something, you know, I think performance is a little bit tricky because, you know, galleries, museums, et cetera, are still working through what does it mean to own a performance, and how do you put them on to the artist's specifications, what happens when the artist is no longer around, so I think there's some questions there about how do you actually own experiential art, um, but certainly videos and other multimedia type artworks. Um, I have a bunch. One of the other things that we found in our um, research was that uh, millennial and Gen Z collectors do are gravitating more towards works that um, are engaged with their particular community or an issue that they care about. Um, you know, in, Joanna, in, in your work with Four Freedoms or with We Buy Gold, I think that seems like a, a theme that you guys are latching onto as, as well, but does that have a, a commercial or art audience component to it? Um, I think that it does. I think that it's about, um, like Elena was explaining, bringing people in and hoping that they become collectors. I think for me, thinking about the experience has been about thinking about how to build community and that experience of being able to participate in the art world in a way that is welcoming and inclusive and in a much wider landscape than I think many have felt has been the case in previous generations. So We Buy Gold and For Freedoms, it's not necessarily you know, to, to make money, but we're hoping to engage the audience with art. And um, you know, with We Buy Gold, there was definitely more of that element than the super PAC, totally different kind of conversations. Um, but yeah, access was really, really important in terms of allowing the space for people to come in at very different price points, even if as low as you know, merch and participating in that way. I found that it really excited people because it felt like it gave them something to kind of latch onto to become a part of it and had so many conversations with really, really young people who aspire to start collecting one day and really never felt like they had um, the access or were able to even walk through the doors comfortably. Um, so definitely, yeah. I was going to say, I think that it also speaks so much that, you know, there is a generation of collectors who are influenced by, you know, music and all of these sort of art being much more prominent. Um, and whether it's in, you know, Beyonce videos or uh, Kanye album covers, there's always been a connection, but now it's just, you feel it much more. And we all saw it, you know, over at the Dior show um, at, beside the Rubel collection this Tuesday as well. It's interesting, the more and more crossover that happens, the more kind of audiences are exposed that feel like art could be something for them. And then I guess it's also, and, and maybe to, to pivot a little bit into 
um, what the industry could do slightly differently to address this audience. It's about kind of, you know, how do we make them feel like, okay, I'm standing on the threshold of the transaction. How do I actually start collecting? Um, you know, I'm curious if there are any kind of learnings in your, um, since switching more into a direct uh, relationship with collectors again at Werner, have there been any particular learnings on what's uh, helped convert um, buyers, particularly in the younger generation? Um, well, the certainly um, key factor is having the right um, inventory and having really work that you know they um, are excited about. But of course, after that, really um, timeliness has been a key thing. And um, you know, on my team, we have. Um, we have someone who actually answers inquiries, and our goal is really that when you inquire, you are immediately, you know, introduced to one of these directors um, or um, a sales uh, partner in a way that you know collectors now expect. With you know everything being so instant, with Uber, everything, all the apps that we use, it's sort of just a new culture of um, immediacy. And of course, art should not be that, but you do expect a response. And so I think that in the past it was, you know, when I started at Artsy, we would see sometimes someone inquire and two weeks later you'd get a response. And I don't think that's acceptable anymore with what collectors expect. Yeah, we've certainly seen that since we introduced uh, buy now and make offer op option on the Artsy marketplace, conversion has gone up significantly. And the time to sale too. I mean, you know, it's gone from a few weeks to a few hours on average. And, you know, while I think for certain works that, that back and forth with the gallerists and developing that conversation is really important for others, it really is catching in that moment um, when the collector has intent, when they're most passionate about the purchase. Um, you know, another thing for us there has been public pricing. Um, you know, we see that works published onto the platform with their prices public or between two and six times more likely to sell than those without. Um, and particularly on the younger end, it just seems that people want to have the information there readily available to make the decision. I think public pricing is so key for younger collectors. I mean, even sort of starting out myself at looking at the art market, how, how is anyone supposed to know sort of um, what the value of uh, certain work is if galleries are not willing to really be open about that? And online, obviously, is um, a medium that allows for that. Educational component really allows everyone to sort of learn um, at their own pace and also uh, really fill in the blanks. But pricing is really something that has been consistent and key for us in all our online um, viewing rooms that we've done. Um, and so whether the object, again, is you know, 2,000 or 1.8 million, we will put it up there. And you as a collector are able to start learning and understanding um, you know, where that comes from. Because I think that's a mystery. And a lot of you know, my friends ask me, how, how are artworks priced? Yeah, I, it's still a mystery probably to a lot of people. Uh, Paul, I'm curious like, how you developed your kind of education around that piece in particular. Around pricing in specific? Um, I think you, part of it is just, I think, comfortability, but, you know, there's a lot more data that's available. So even if you were to just, you know, look at a bunch of auction data, I think you could definitely get a certain sense, um, I think, to really go into it. And, you know, my background is in finance, so it's probably easier or more, feels more normal to, you know, match up artists' res CVs, track records, museum shows, size of the work, the medium, and think about, okay, does this price generally make sense in my mind versus other things that I've seen or artists that are at the same point in their careers from a expensive, less expensive thing. But certainly, you know, all types of factors um, play a role. You know, like if an artist only makes, you know, 10 works a year, that's going to be a d very different scenario than an artist that makes 100 works a year. So there's a lot that I think goes into price that, you know, I think is everybody has kind of said is, is slightly opaque, but when you, you know, peel back the onion, it, it probably does make sense um, most of the time. But, you know, I do agree with, you know, what Joanna was saying that it's, it sometimes is hard to, from both the gallery side and the collector side, probably to have some of these, these conversations. Um, I think when you're, you have a relationship with a gallery and you're comfortable with them, I think it's a little easier um, to, to talk frankly about some stuff, but certainly if you were coming to a gallery for a first time or buying your first work, 
you might feel scared to even, is it okay to ask for the price? Like if I ask for it, is it embarrassing? Is someone gonna laugh at me? Does that mean I can't afford it? Um, it's, it's tricky. And we certainly see that people are standing on the sidelines that would otherwise be buying if they, if they could see it. And I think, it, but it is, it has been such a, it's a relatively recent thing in the industry. You know, within the last 50, 100 years, the prices got completely wiped off the wall and it was seen as kind of gauche. Um, but I, I, I do wonder if kind of generationally this will, this will change as we move away from the Gen Z collector who might have been, or the Gen X collector, I should say, who might have been a bit more concerned with uh, exclusivity and status uh, to a different, different generation. Joanna, is that it, when you guys think about your online sales, does that factor in at all, or are there other things, adjustments that you're making uh, as as you interact online or, or with younger folks? We're a little traditional in that sense, I will admit. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, tr price transparency when we're having conversations, of course. Um, but it's a constant kind of push and pull of, of trying to figure out, um, yeah, how to, how to evolve, but also hold on to a kind of privacy. I have collectors who've gotten upset that their, you know, the price of the painting they bought at the fair was in the newspaper, for example, you know, in a market report. And um, so it's kind of balancing that as well. I think that that's still a reality for a lot of people and having a bit of privacy around that. Um, but when we do online sales, I mean, it's all via email and all of that becomes transparent. But you have to start the conversation. Are the collectors that uh, tend to complain when the price gets put out there, are they, do they tend to be the older, more traditional collectors, or is it across the board? Um, I've actually had that experience with some younger collectors. Yeah, so I don't know what that means for the greater conversation, but that's been the experience. Interesting. Paul, I'm, I'm kind of interesting more on a ground level. Are there other other things that you've observed in your experience that have been kind of turn off or, or other kind of real basic updates to gallery behavior strategy that you feel like would bring in uh, more people like yourself? Um, I think it's, you know, it mainly comes down, I think, to, you know, the transparency thing that I think everybody has mentioned across a couple levels, just sort of knowing you know, sometimes where you stand in terms of, you know, obviously it's a system, you know, if you're trying to acquire something that a lot of other people want, you know, the expectation that you would get it just by walking in the door is, you know, probably um, not something that you could have. But I think there is, you know, and I hear it sometimes from friends that are also like, you know, you know, I don't know what the definition of good collector is, but seasoned collectors. And I think it's, Part of it is knowing that if you do the things, you know, correctly, you know, that you've known the gallery for a couple of years, maybe you've bought other things from the programs, that you, you know, have a diverse collection that would fit well with this artist, that, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that that's taken into account somewhere. And I think I've definitely, definitely seen situations where, you know, maybe this has been like a two-year ongoing conversation and the work comes and it's given to the Peter Brandt's of the world with nothing against Peter Brandt and it going to foundations or museums. But if it never happens that one goes to a younger collector or a collector that's not a private museum, it, it can be discouraging. Um, and I think certain galleries, you know, again, with the transparency and the talking, do have different levels of managing that. And you know, sometimes it's, you know, the economics of it, sometimes it's someone's budget. But, you know, I've definitely had galleries, you know, proactively say, hey, we know you're interested in this artist. We know that the price level has always been a problem for you. We're, we're getting a key work that's on the smaller size. Maybe this is the one that you could do. We could be helpful in maybe giving you a payment plan, something. And I find those overtures from the galleries, like, really great and really show that it's, time that you know we've gotten together and that it's well spent and that there is a relationship there and someone's listening to your interest and you know valuing what you're trying to do as a collector and trying to you know help you build their collection in you know the ways that they can i think it's a really interesting point it, it just in terms of um you know not trying to fit all collectors into the same box and making an overture that like yes we're building this art world for you too 
Um, you know, I think we do have a tendency as an industry to create a universe that suits the art news top 200 collectors really well. Um, and that is important for the artist's career. It's important for them to be in museums. Uh, but I think everything that we can do to, as you said, have, uh, have younger buyers feel like they are being seen and being recognized and being built for as well, a little bit more user-centric mentality um, can be really key. Um, and I think that related to something you said earlier, Elena, about having to, you, you cannot get access to a work in the online viewing rooms if you don't inquire, is that correct? So I was gonna say, it's actually, um Basically, to to have access, you have to inquire, which for us has really been, um, you know, to step back, just part of the initiative of really placing focus on um, this portal that we see as an access point for new collectors as well as international collectors. And, um, you know, even for something as Miami Online, which is the current um, viewing room that we have up, um, several of the works have sold to collectors we've never ever known that we're not in our database from you know just this week which is um, pretty incredible but um, you know to give you guys a statistic like 45 percent of our inquiries come from collectors we don't know who are new to the gallery um, but really the range and um, it, it is really um, really full from someone who is buying their first artwork and they saw it through Instagram to the MoMA trustees and the, you know, our top 200 collectors. But they all have to come through the channel and, you know, follow the same path. Um, and for us, that's really sort of, we make it that sort of separate space and really um, designate inventory and work uh, and work with our artists to really make sure that it's thoughtful and a constant presentation. Do you have any sense of where that, those 45% of people are coming from? Is it through social media? Is it through other uh, means? You would probably know that better from Artsy, having more data. Uh, but um, you know, for us, really, all, all the sort of channels are, are key. And so um, email, obviously, is key. Social media, um, organic search, th those are all sort of entry points. Um, I have a question. If you, if you see it online and it says it's an inquiry, because I I just looked at your room like before the fair started. Do you, do you, for people that have a relationship with the gallery, is it should you email your current contact or should you inquire online? You should still inquire online because it'll then go directly to your contact, but um, it you know, shows us that you've engaged and been to that space. Cool. In some ways, I feel like it, we've like, built a much better PDF than just sending it by email. Uh, I, I always do think it's funny when people say, oh no, I don't do online sales, and then they're selling all these works via PDF in their email before the fair. Um, That's the thing, I mean, it's really just the next step of a PDF of the JPEG sales, but here you really get the extra narrative context, and I think that's what artists really um, have engaged with and liked, is um, being able to tell the story of the work and really share what their perspective is, as well as provide that additional information, which, you know, if you're getting a tour with someone like Joanna at the gallery, you get that, but if you're not fortunate enough and you want to learn about one of the works um, in their program, it's really useful for that. Absolutely. I think we're getting close to the end of our time, so I want to open up to some audience questions. Uh, feel free to raise your hand, and then there should be two people with microphones that'll come around. Um. Okay, hello. Uh, my question is to Elena. Uh, you mentioned about transparency in pricing, and my question is, you don't show your prices on Artsy, David Zerner, uh, and why is that? We have um, our pricing on our own portal uh, because there you are um, entering your email and that is sort of one way that we welcome you and we sort of know who you are and much like you'll walk into a fair booth and start the conversation, that is our way of starting the conversation with you. I have a follow-up question to the pricing discussion. I know that payment plans and discounts are theater theoretically available, but I always feel sheepish about raising the issue because I'm worried about galleries won't consider me to be a serious collector if I do. So I was just wondering the circumstances under which it was appropriate or not appropriate to raise those two issues. Uh, I think everyone should ask. I think everyone should ask and it's always appropriate and every collector does. 
so you should always ask. It's not always possible, but you should always ask. You know, I think that that's something we've seen also in talking to a number of the providers that do those services. Ultimately, frequently, may, maybe not for an artist where you have a very long list of demand, but whether it's in the art industry or not, uh, payment plans have been shown to increase revenues. So people will generally be relatively uh, open to that option. Hi, um, I joined a bit late, so I'm not sure if this question's already been answered, but I've heard the phrase a good collector a few times through this talk, and I just wanted to understand what's your definition of a good collector? <laughs> um, to me, the difference sometimes between someone that's collecting or versus someone that's just buying art, and I think you know, it's something that's made me feel good when people have come over to see my collection is that it has a sense of that person's personality, whatever it might be that's driving them. And I think there's a desire for those people that I, you know, consider good collectors that are, you know, you get this feeling that, you know, I probably have, you know, half to two thirds of say my collection installed at any given time. But if a painting's not, you know, on the wall, like a year later, I might be like, wow, I miss living with that. And so I think there's some kind of like intent that you're building something and it's not necessarily kind of buying and selling or there's, you know, a personality and an intent and like learning about the artist. And for me, it's also been that it's really become a part of my life and that I'm friends with a lot of the artists and the gallerists and a lot of my social life also now revolves around the art world, which I totally didn't expect when I started it. Um, but I think it's how the, you know, that you add your personality to what you're collecting makes it end up being, you know, a stronger collection versus just, you know, good artworks. Can I add to that also? And then I think we also think about like the willingness of a, of a collector to lend work for an artist in, you know, institutional show or not to enter it into a speculative marketplace shortly after uh, collecting the work. So there are those kind of um, factors considered as well. I have a question. Um, you had mentioned the difference or the variation between an artist that might create, say, 10 pieces a year versus someone that creates more than that or maybe more prolific. Um, I know there's no formula to pricing, but are you suggesting that, that, that the person that only produces 10 is going to have a higher pricing point or maybe it's just a matter of the inventory, you know, that they have accessible versus them having more because it's, you know, it's, it's so subjective. So is there, you know, can you kind of expound on that? Uh, I think it's in the context of if you took, you know, in a very pragmatic way, if you took two artists in the same medium that have the same amount of museum shows and the same amount of people that want to acquire both their works and one artist produces less, I don't know if that would lend that it, the price would be higher just as a flat yes, but I think it would make it probably more difficult to acquire the works and depending on gotcha. you know if the gallery to support you know working with that artist, if they have a fewer limited works to sell, you know, the economics of their gallery, it's, it's harder sometimes when, you know, yeah. if you're gonna have a show with this artist and you're only gonna get a smaller number of works, sometimes they feel that it's um, okay to price the works higher because the artist also needs to right. live off the okay. fewer works that they're selling right. or maybe puts more time into them. Okay, and one other really quick question. Um, uh, for artists that perhaps, you know, are individuals that aren't working with galleries or don't work with galleries on a consistent basis, um, what are some ways that you see the newer generation being able to be approachable in the sense of, you know, kind of off the wall ways of exhibiting your work? You know, um, maybe it's not in a gallery, so maybe it's somewhere else. What other ways have you all seen people kind of think outside the box as individual artists in terms of exhibiting their work and trying to engage in, um, you know, different, um, different groups of possible collectors, introducing themselves 
getting known? I think there's a long history of artist-run spaces that has been really, really important to art history, generally speaking. And it's a really wonderful way for artists to build community, collectively show their own work. So that's something that I think is you know, a really beautiful thing that continues um, online, I think a lot of people do. Don't know so much about those spaces, but I think it's a thing. I think there are also people that you know, look at you know social media and likes, and there are people that now I think support those types of artists where they feel that they can. Maybe they don't have a space, but you know are looking to coffee shops, public spaces, hotels, different real estate venues that art can be shown, and are actually seeking out artists that don't have galleries but have followings. Other ways to determine whether or not they might you know, be successful at selling their work and placing it in different um, venues outside of a gallery um, is also, I think, a new thing that a couple of people have raised. Yeah. I think one also, just to follow up on your first question, one important point is that uh, with this question around scarcity, um, there has been a tendency in the art market to hold back a certain number of inventory, only releasing it over time to create this false sense of scarcity. What we've actually found is that particularly among younger collectors, having access to all the works that are available at any one time makes them more likely to connect with one individual piece because they are less inclined to engage in a lot of back and forth. Um, they they want to be able to see it, pick out the piece and buy it. So there's, there's a little bit of a, a counter move towards this, like, let's release one or two pieces a year and that's going to prop up the price because it, it's a, it's a passion-led investment. Hi, everyone. Um, this was a great panel discussion. Um, and you guys have pretty much validated a lot of things for me as a founder of uh, Art Hub. Um, that's A-R-T-E-H-U-B. Um, we are an e-commerce art discovery marketplace uh, for aspiring uh, art collectors, um, emerging artists, and uh, mid, small to mid-sized uh, art galleries. Um, we are an early stage startup, um, and we received a seed investment from the founders of Home Depot. Um, and one of the challenges uh, that we um, have come to um, is partnering with art galleries uh, because they're afraid that we're going to uh, disrupt their margins and their you know business model and that's not our intention so my question for you all is how can like what should our approach be or what advice would you give to someone like uh, us that is you know trying to help and not harm uh, anyone in this process. We're just trying to democratize the space and make it more accessible for people to uh, globally, art collectors globally or aspiring art collectors to be able to find new, uh, new uh, exclusive pieces or niche uh, you know, art pieces around the world in different markets, that make art markets, if that makes sense. I can take that from an artsy perspective since a cornerstone of our strategy since the very beginning has been to be a partner to industry. You know, we really believe strongly in uh, the role that galleries play, the way that they facilitate artists' careers and really have the artist's best interest in, at their center. And that's, without them, you know, this wouldn't exist. Um, so I think it's, it's really about doing the work of building up the trust over time, um, working with the right people, making sure um, that you just continually reassure the galleries that yes, we are here to help and, and having a business model that supports that as well, of course, uh, helps. I mean, one thing I'll add that I've heard from other galleries as well is, you know, with um, multiple online platforms as well as your own, that is a resource of time management. That, so I think just showing a concept that um, that is going to be innovative and bring something new to the table or, um, you know, reach a new demographic galleries value that immensely um, and are very open to that. And I think more and more are looking for those opportunities. So it, it's really just about making sure that um, you, know, you understand the needs there and uh, what kind of reach you offer. Hi. Um, so I was wondering what do you think of the fact that um, so you have more people going to museums now and more likely to go to museums. And from the private collection side, Maybe it allows more young pe people to be collectors, but at the same time democratizing a good art that is mainly a luxury good. So do you think, what do you think of this development, whether it's from the perspective of young collectors? Well, um, I, 
I saw a um, report, and I'm trying to think of where it was, but that as more people visit the Metropolitan Museum's website, more people then um, translate it into going into the museum. And I think that sort of learning is really essential, is that whichever way, whether it's through podcasts, through online, through you know just even discussions, younger collectors are interested to learn, and I think that's translating to them being very engaged um, in actually attending institutions. And then, of course, there's sort of an image culture that proliferates, and um, what's amazing is some museums, you have something where it, it becomes viral, um, such as Kusama, and many people maybe have never stepped into that museum, but are going for the first time, and hopefully having a significant experience and learning something and going to be coming back because of that. So whichever sort of way they get there, it's really exciting that um, it is becoming much more um, part of the mainstream dialogue nowadays. Hi there. Um, this question is mainly for Elena, but would love the thoughts of others as well. Um, so a few years ago at the same Art Basel conversations, um, a very famous gallery owner said that he felt like what was happening in the Instagram world didn't really pertain to his world, that his uh, buyers were kind of distinct from that. Um, and I was really astounded as a young collector myself that someone would kind of eschew that um, forum as pertaining to him. And so I'm curious, for you, how difficult has it been institutionally to gain resources for your part of the organization? And do you feel like the success of your part of the organization has expanded what um, some of the more influential gallery owners are willing to take risks with and do in, in the traditional gallery space? I feel very fortunate that um, David brought me in to um, start this new team and um, you know obviously um, the innovation and focus on digital is very much at the core um, of the gallery's um, program and vision for the future um, and really for us that comes from a sense that we want to serve our artists and those are sort of the North Star and to be the best gallery for them we need to sort of also develop and adapt into the sort of future and whatever 10 or 20 or 50 years beyond will look like, which is certainly um, online is going to be a big part of. So um, with that, um, you know, I, I feel that I sort of I've been very well received and it's been very um, integrated into a lot of the efforts that we've done um, also on focusing on a lot of editorial aspects and building out that team and really thinking about it um, as sort of an extension of um, you know the editorial part is an extension of publishing coming online and what we're doing on my team is an extension of what the sales team has been doing for a while and working with the artists to create shows and so in a lot of ways how um, we talk about it is really thinking of online as our seventh gallery space um, and you know it really has to be um, it has to be really a core belief I think to, to make it real but um, for our artists um, for everyone who um, works at the gallery really we think of it that way wherein uh, we have dedicated resources such as you know whether it's assistance but as well um, registrar resources that go for working on the online space, um, which makes it a priority for us. Yeah, and I think you know there was a question at one point of will the industry move online at all? Then when? And now it's more of like how quickly. And I, you know, as more and more of the major galleries do make significant investments online, that certainly helps. But it's also just been seeing a new generation and, and more people kind of get a lot of use out of it. And the more transactions that happen online, the less of that kind of opinion I think will exist. Um, it, you know, gallery is the most important thing at the end of the day is making sales as well as helping their artists. So, it, but but it's funny because what you say also, you know, when I first started at Artsy, I was, um, I remember begging galleries for images, and you know, I had to sort of convince people that we were not gonna just duplicate or you know carelessly put them online. That there was an intent, and how much the industry has shifted even in the six years since then is amazing, and hopefully you've seen it as well. We have time for one more question, probably. Uh, Elena, question to you. I've noticed that the bigger galleries, the more innovative galleries like Zwerner and Hauser and Wirth, you guys are starting huge publishing concerns. There's a library, there's a bookstore. Has that helped increase your sales, or can you directly um, relate those sales of the books to increase sales in buying art? That's a great question. I 
I, I, you know, I would say there's not a direct connection, um, but I think it comes back to the point of serving our artists um, and our collectors in the m most meaningful and um, you know uh, engaging way. And certainly, uh, since uh, since the gallery mounts shows that you know are really significant to an artist's career and also can support shows that are um, you know broader, such as the Endless Enigma, which brought together centuries worth of art. Um, it, it really, the sort of scholarly um, and uh, publishing arm it, it is an important aspect of that. So um, Lucas Werner has been heading that up. And again, it's sort of, you know, it's really broad where it's everything from, you know, catalogs um, of shows to uh, actually publications of, um, you know, books that are completely unrelated to our program, but we culturally feel should be out there in the world um, and relate sort of to the core beliefs. And then translating into something like the podcast, which is maybe more digestible and engaging conversation. And so that's sort of all holistic. And we don't see it as sort of um, a standalone. It's really part of all of the efforts that we do for our artists. Thank you all so much. Um, and thank you three of you for, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.